Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2022. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Always make sure the book is in front of you when you're doing work with me. Today we'll solve some problem that you will find on page number 121. Let's start to it. Page 121, the very first problem that you see there, problem number 61. In problem number 61, we are told that 0 is less than A, A is less than B, B is less than C. The question is, of the three statements that are given to us, which one, uh, which one is true and which one is false? First one says 2A is greater than B plus C. Well, 2A is simply A plus A. A plus A. And A we know is less than B and this A is less than C. How can this be true? 2A cannot possibly be greater than B plus C. Statement number 1 is false. In statement number 2 we are told that C minus A is greater than B minus A. If you were to add if you were to add A to both sides, A drops out and C, it says, is greater than B, which is exactly what we are told here. C is greater than B. Statement number 2 is correct. The statement, the statement 3 goes on to tell us that C over A is less than B over A. Because A, B and C are positive, we can very easily multiply both sides of the inequality by negative number, multiply or divide, without having to worry about changing the direction of the inequality. If we multiply both sides by A, A drops out, then what we end up saying is that C is less than B, which is not true. C is greater than B. Statement 3 is wrong. It is 2 only. Statement 2 only. Statement 1 and 3 are wrong. Number 62. In number 62, we are told that we have a line such that the origin is the midpoint. This is P, this is Q, this is O, and we are told that P to O is equal to O to Q. Origin is the midpoint. We are further told that the coordinates of P are R and S. The question simply is, what are the coordinates of point Q? Well, let's find out, shall we? If the X coordinate is I, which means R, which means this distance from here to here, has to be the same, as this distance from here to here because this is the midpoint. This distance is the same as that distance. From here to here is negative r, so the x coordinate is negative r. Similarly, the vertical distance s, here the vertical distance will be negative s. That's all. The coordinates of point q are negative r and negative s. 63. Let's see what, let's see what we have in 63. Now 63 is a little bit more involved. I'm going to have to erase this thing. In 63, we are asked to find the greatest standard deviation of the five data set that is given to us. 45, 55, 50, 50. 45, 55, 50, and 50. Next one is 10, 30, 30, 10. 10, 30, 30, 10. 34, 28, 28, 34, 28, 28, and 38, and finally 39, 42, 41, 39, 42, 41, 38, and the last one 50, 60, 60, 70, 50, 60, 60, and 70. The standard deviation as we know is simply the summation of the square of all the deviations from the mean. We take each observation, find out how much does it deviate because that's what the standard deviation measures. It measures the dispersion of the observation around the mean. The more dispersed they are, the higher the standard deviation. Before we do any work at all, before we actually do any calculation, which of course in the real exam we will not have the time to do all this calculation that we are about to do. In real exam, you simply have to observe. And you can see, for example, here, this is very tight. 34, 28, these are all very close together. Especially this one, this is all very close together. 
Here, this is 60, this is 60, this is 10 less than 60, this is 10 more than 60, which means the average here is 60. The average, average of this thing, let's put down the mean here, the average here is 60, which means if you square the deviation, we're going to get 10 squared, 10 squared, you're going to get 10 squared and 10 squared. The, the, the sum of the square of the division is going to be 200 here, but here it's going to be very little. The, the average is around 40. This is this is one less than 40, this is two more than 40, this is one more than 40, this is two, there you go, average is 40. If average is 40, they're all, they're all around 1 and 2. When you square them, we don't have to actually sp spend the time to do it actually, we should be able to see that 1 square plus 2 square plus 1 square plus 2 square is, is not going to be anywhere close to 200. The, this one is not the answer. A, B, C, D is not the answer. So far the winner is, winner is E. Similarly here, the average is going to be around 30. Average is going to be around 30. Let's find out, shall we? This is 4 more than 30. This is 2 less than 30. This is 2 less than 30. This is 8 more than 30. Positive 4, negative, negative, they cancel out. Oh, so we were wrong. Or to be more precise, I was wrong. I assumed that the average is around 30. We still have 8 left over, which means the average is around 30. Average is not around 32. It is 32 because we need to spread this ad evenly among the four people. By the time we spread the A, the average is now 32. Again, here we, we're going to square the 2 because 34 is 2. This is 32. But one more time, in the real exam, we're not going to be actually doing this thing. This is 2 squared. This is going to be 4 squared. This is 4 squared. This is 6 squared. These quantities are not going to be anywhere close to 200. But I hope that you're able to see this guy right away from the very beginning, in, within seconds. They're all very spread out. The average is 20 here. Average is 20 because this is, we need a 10 more here, take a 10 away from here, take a 10 away from here, take, give, give 10 to this guy. The average is 20 here. See, you take a 10 away from here, give it to this guy, it becomes 20, this becomes 20, this becomes, they're all 20. The average is 20 and they're all quite far apart. Here what we're looking at is here, this should be a 10. Here what we're looking at here is 10 squared, 10 squared, 10 squared, 10 squared. It is 4 times 10 squared. That is 400. This guy is out. And this is just negative 5 and a positive 5. 5 squared and 5 squared is just going to give us 50. The answer is B. The answer is B. Because the mean here is 50. The answer to this question is B. But it took too long. In the real exam, just by visual observation, you should be able to tell that these are, these are quite spread out. These are not, this, these are very clustered together, these are very close to each other. The contest was only between this guy, E, and B. Even this is very close. It's just 5 squared and 5 squared. Number 64. Number 64 and 65 has to do with break-even point. We are asked to find the break-even point. We are told that the price, we are told that the price is two dollars. We are told that the variable cost is 40 percent of price. We are told that the fixed cost is 5,040. A break-even point is where we are making neither profit nor losses. In other words, in other words, the revenue, revenue has to equal the cost, total cost, which is the fixed cost plus the variable cost. The revenue here is quite straightforward. We're getting two dollars per unit. Let's sell, let's sell Q unit, Q for quantity. So the revenue is going to be two times Q, and we have to find out how many units do we need to sell, how many, what's the quantity that we need to sell in order for us to break even, where we're making neither profit nor loss. The cost is, fixed cost is 5,040, Variable cost is 40% of P, 40% of $1 would have been 40 cents, 40% of $2, price is $2, is going to be 80 cents. So it's just 0.8 times Q. Let's subtract point Q, 0.8 Q from both sides, we'll end up with 1.2 Q over equals 5040. Multiply both sides by 10, we're going to end up with 12 Q is equal to 5040 times 10. And let's just start dividing, that's all. Divide both sides by 2, 
this is going to go away, this becomes 5, and this becomes 6. Let's divide both sides by 2 one more time. 5 has, five has two twos, 1 goes there, becomes a 10. 10 has 5 twos, 4 has two twos, and 0 has no twos. And when you divide this by 2, it becomes 3. We have to go one more round, divide both sides by 3. And we know this number is divisible by 3 because 2 plus 5 is 7, 7 plus 5 is 9. Since the sum, S U M sum of this number, sum of the digits of this number is divisible by 3, therefore it is divisible by 3. Let's divide both sides by 3. 3 goes away, 25 is made up of 6, 6 for the 24. After we take away 24 from the 25, we have a remainder of 1 that goes here, becomes a 12, and 12 has 4. Yes, there you go. 460 times 640 times 5 is what we're looking for. 640, 640 times 10 would have been, uh, oh, this should have been, this should have been 8. 24, 24 is 24, 8 threes are 24. 8 threes are 24. So it's 840. So if you multiply this quantity by 10, you're going to end, you end up with 8,400. We're not multiplying by 10, we're multiplying by 5, so it's going to be half of that, 4,200. 4,200 is the answer. Number 65. In number 65, we are told that the fixed cost is $9,900. We are told that the variable cost is 65 cents per unit. And the price we are told is dollar twenty. It's going to be the same exact setup as here, no difference. So the revenue is simply priced on the quantity dollar twenty, one point two times quantity has to equal nine thousand nine hundred dollars, which is the fixed cost, plus sixty five cents per unit, 0.65 Q. There we go. 120 minus 60 would have been 60. 120 minus 65 is going to be 55. So it's 0.55Q is equal to 9,900. Let's multiply both sides by 100. Uh, by 100, so it becomes 55Q equals 9,900 times 100. Because we multiply both sides by 100, let's, let's start dividing. Let's divide both sides by 11. So that becomes 5, and 99 is made up of 9. Uh, 99 is made up of 9 elevens. Let's do one more time. Divide both sides by 5. It becomes 20. There you go. 9 times 2 is 18. And then we have 1, 2, 3 zeros. It looks like we need to sell 18,000 quantities in order to break even. Anything more than that will make a profit. If we sell fewer than 18,000, we'll make a loss. 65, uh, 66. In 66, let's see, what do we have on 66? Oh, we have a dial there. In 66, we're going to rotate the dial. Through 1,174 intervals. Question is, Where does it stop? And the dial looks something like this. The dial looks something like this. Oh, I don't like it. It's all right. It's cut into eight equal parts. This is where the dial is pointing right now at S, and it starts. The story starts from here. As a, B, C, D, and E. So let's begin, shall we? 1,174. Instead of 1,174, if we had, if we had to rotate, if we had rotated the dial through 10 intervals, 10 interval means that we go through one whole rotation, which is 8, and we stop here because the remainder is 2. We just have to find the remainder here of this number when we divide it by 8. Let's do that, shall we? Let's do it right here. 1,174, let's divide by 8. We have 8, 3, 7, uh, that's 4, 32, 5, 54, 6, 8, 6 is 48, 
there we go. Even if I made any mistakes here, it, it, it really doesn't matter. We really don't care how many complete rotations it goes through, as long as we know what the remainder is. The remainder is 6. So if I wrote down 5 instead of 4, it, it's not going to make any difference. We have 6 remainders, which means if you were to rotate this dial through 1174 intervals, it will go through 146 complete revolutions and 6 more intervals to go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and this is right here is 6, looks like the answer is E. Answer to this problem is E. And that was 66. Let's look at 67. Sixty-seven says one hundred eighty-one is approximately what percentage greater than seventy-nine? One hundred eighty-one is approximately what percentage greater than seventy-nine? Since they're looking for approximation, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're not going to worry about the exact calculation. So we're going to pretend that 181 is 180. And the question now becomes 180 is what percentage greater than instead of 79, just use 80. We're going to answer that question. 180 is what percentage greater than 180? 180 is what percentage greater than 80? Well, 180, 180 as we know, is made up of 80 plus 80 plus 20. This 80 represents 100% of 80. This 20 represents 25 percent. There we go. It looks like 180 is exactly 125 percent more than 80. Therefore, 181 is approximately 125 percent more than 79. That was number 67. Let's look at 68. Number 68. In number 68, we are given an equation We are told that the graph of x times y equals k, where k is less than 0, falls in which quadrants? We are not interested in finding out we are not interested in finding out the exact shape of the graph, we are not interested in plotting it, we simply have to be able to tell where does it fall if we were to plot it, if we were to draw it. Let's find out. First quadrant, second quadrant, third quadrant and fourth quadrant. Let's see what happens. We know x times y has to equal k, but we also know that k is negative. k is negative, k is, k is less than zero. If k is negative, there is only two ways you can have a product of two numbers to be negative. One is that, one is that x is positive and y is negative. The other one is, or x is negative and y is positive. Those are the only two ways we can have. Let's find out, shall we? Here, x is going to be positive and y is going to be positive. That's no good. Here, x is negative and y is going to be positive. Very good, that works. Second quadrant works. Here, x is going to be negative and y is negative. That's no good. Here x is positive and y is negative. There you go. So it's fourth quadrant and the second quadrant. Second and fourth quadrant. The graph of this, this equation falls in second and fourth quadrant. What actually it looks like, we really don't care. Number, seven, number 69. <coughs> number 69 says, that the tank is one-third full already to which to which we're going to add n liter as a result as a result it is now we are told seventh night full it is now seventh night full simply is 
what is the capacity of this tank a tank which is one third full already to which we add n liter, n liter of liquid in it and when that when we did that it is now seven ninth full so let's find out what happened it is now seven ninth full but in the beginning it was only one third full so how much did we fill it up let's find out shall we let's multiply top and bottom by three seven minus three is four so this is four nine which means which means the four ninth of the capacity of the tank must equal n liters and all they want all they want is the capacity expressed in terms of n capacity is simply going to be bring the 9 over there on the top and bring the 4 down that's all capacity is simply 9 times n over 4 that's all that was number 69 let's look at number 70 number 70 In number 70 we are told that the area of the large rectangle is equal to 2 times the area of the small rectangles. And the rectangles look like this. We are told that this is W, this is 100. This is 150 and this is W again. This is a small rectangle they're talking about. And that's the large rectangle. And the area of this guy is half the area of that bigger one or the bigger one is twice the size of this one. Let's see what we can do. Area of the large rectangle is simply going to be this side which is W plus 100 times this side which is 150 150 plus W and that has to be 2 times the area of the small one which is 100 times 150. We're going to stop right here because if we were to continue with this madness, with this insanity, if you were to continue with it, I hope you are able to see that we're going to soon end up with a very nasty quadratic equation. A very nasty quadratic equation that we, that we do not want to deal with. The way to go here is to look at the answer choices. Answer choices are 25, 50, 75, 100, and 200. Answer has to be one of these five. Why don't we try one of them and see what happens. And when we do that, it's always a good idea to, to start with a happy compromise. Happy, comp happy compromise is the middle one. 75. So let's pretend W is 75. So this is going to be 75 plus 100, that is 175, times 150 plus 75 is going to be 225 equals to 2 times 100 times 150. I hope that you're able to tell right away that this is not the right answer. C is not the right answer. It's no way. Because here, 175 times 250, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it's going to be odd number. Odd times odd is odd. And this is an even quantity. They're not equal to each other. But we're, but we're going to continue with it anyway. We're going to continue with this madness anyway because it's going to tell us which way to go. We need to know whether we need to go up or down. And for that, we have to finish this thing. Even though we know they do not equal to each other, let's divide both sides by 75. 175 is made up of 775 because 200 is made up of 875. If 200 has 8, 825, I meant to say, 200 is made up of 825, therefore 175 must be made up of 725s. And let's divide this side by 25, we get a 4. Let's go one more round. 150 is made up of 625. If 200 is made, of, made up of 825, then 225 must be made up of 925. As you can see, this is, this is far more than this. What does it tell us? It tells us that we need to go to the lower quantity. Let's try 50. That was too large. W was too large. W has to be smaller. Let's try 50. If you try 50, you get 50 plus 100 is 150 times 150 plus uh, W is two, 200 and that has to equal to 2 times 100 times 150. What do you know? There you go. 2 times 100 right there and 150. The answer is B. The answer is B. B works. Let's look at 71. In 
1971 we are dealing with interest rate both simple interest rate and compounded interest rate we are told that we can make two investments one investment is a 6% simple interest rate on $8,000 we are going to invest $8,000 and on other instrument we are going to get 8% compounded semi-annually on 10000 and our job is to figure out what is the total amount of interest that we are going to earn let's begin shall we this is very straightforward 6% of 1000 6% of 1000 is just 60 on 8000 it's going to be 8 times as much because 6% you just drop the two zeros is 80 so it's going to be 480 so that was the easy part what about here Whenever you see a question like this having to do with compound interest, when they are asking for a compound interest, it is always a good idea to figure out the simple interest first. If we can figure out the simple interest first, that will tell us that the answer cannot possibly be anything less than that or equal to that. The answer would have to be bigger than that because it is being compounded. Let's first figure out the simple interest, 8% annually on 10000 On $10,000, if you have 10000 1% is just 100 8% is going to be 8 times as much. So it's 800. 800 plus 480 that's 1280 and that tells us that the answer, any answer that is equal to or less than 1280 cannot possibly be the right answer. Now at this point we look at the answer choices and cross out all of them that don't qualify. And when we do that we will find that A, B, C and D do not work. The last one must be the answer. If this were a real exam, I would stop right here. I'm not going to waste my time continuing with it because it's the only one left. But just to satisfy your curiosity, we can continue with this madness and actually show that the quantity that is shown in E is in fact the right quantity. In E, we are told, what number are we at? It is 1296. 1296. We came up at 1280. Let's see what the discrepancy is. So let's, let's do that then, shall we? So for the first six months, for the first six months, we get 8%, half of that, we get 8% of 10,000, which is 400. That was easy. So at the end of the first six months, what we have is 10,400 in the account. And now we get 4% on this amount, 4% of 10,400. 1% 1 of 10,400 is simply 100, 104. 104, 104, 104, 104. There you go, that's where the 16 comes from. So it's 416. This is what we're going to earn the second second six months. The first six months we earn six, 400. And here we earn 480. So here we have 480. And in the first six months we earn 400. Last six months, second six months we earn 416. And that's where the discrepancy of $16 was. The answer is E. But all of that was unnecessary, completely unnecessary. Once you figure out the simple interest rate, and that allows you to knock out four answer choices. The story is over basically. We're going to stop right here. We'll meet again tomorrow. We're going to pick up from where we left off. In the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, if you would like to work with me, if you would like to hire my services to get you ready for the exam, you can send me an email. Go to my website at kashwaniprev.com. From there you can send me an email or fill out a form if you wish to tell me a little bit more about yourself and we'll talk some more. Alright? I'll see you tomorrow. Bye now.